welcome back to some more with Tanagashi. Alright, so... Where we last left off, well... Uh, apparently, some more propaganda advertising on the food stalls and then another awkward coincidence happened. So, yeah. But let's continue reading. I gave up on finding the others and wandered around trying to look for a place where I'd be able to see better. Oh yeah, so we're on the the ceremony part. You see better. It didn't take long for me to realize I'd have to settle for watching between the heads of the people in front of me though. Thump. Once again, an even louder taiko drum resounded. This one was to announce the beginning of the dance. I couldn't see very well, but it seemed like Rikachan had come on stage with the elders, who were in priestly garb. I heard low exhalations of admiration and the seniors rubbing their prayer beads in gratitude. Everyone's heads were in the way, and I couldn't see. It was really frustrating. We should have cut playtime short and come here to get good spots earlier. After Rikachan intoned the prayer, she took the festival hoe and walked to the pile of quilts stacked on the altar. That's right, the point of the ceremony was to purify bedding and to hold a memorial service, wasn't it? Then the solemn offertory dance began. She had practiced using a mochi pounding mallet. The awkwardly shaped festival hoe Rikachan held seemed pretty heavy. I mean, really heavy, or whatever. Back and forth, up and down. It was doubtlessly difficult to even lift in the air, but she sweated and waved, raised and dropped it again and again. She couldn't just deal with it and do it grudgingly. As the shrine maiden, she needed to retain the dignity and solemnity, solemnity present at this festival. There must be a ton of pressure on Rikachan's shoulders right now. Damn, why am I cheering her on from a place I can barely see her? I'm her friend, so I should be right up in the best spot rooting for her. I don't know. Keichan, over here! Someone tugged lightly on the back of my shirt collar. It was Shion. She beckoned me outside the crowded ring of people. She had a mischievous grin on her face, and I took it as her saying she knew a good place nobody else knew of. Shion? What's up? Shh. Just be quiet and come with me. After she told me so, she ran in a big detour around the throng. Mm, I'm gonna. Let me pause real quick. I'm very curious of what's gonna happen. Why do I get this feeling I'm just going to be a little bit more sketchy on this one? Oh man. Oh, God. Anyway, throng. Man, it's great to have someone who knows the lay of the land here at times like this. Impressed though I was, I nearly lost sight of her right. Uh, I nearly lost sight of her right away. No more getting separated from me. I ran after her so that I wouldn't be left behind. As I wondered in anticipation what kind of secret spot Shion had in mind, we left the crowd of people and went around to the back of the shrine grounds. Hey, wait. Where are we going? We're getting further and further away. Shh. Just stay quiet and follow me. You'll understand soon. Shion gave me a wink that reminded me of Mion as she said that. No sign of people and not much moonlight, it was dark. We had gotten pretty far away from the crowd of people on the shrine grounds. How are we supposed to see Rikachan's dance from here? I see. There's some high spot around I see there's some high spot around here, isn't there? Like a rooftop or somewhere we can look down at it, right? What? Why do we have to climb onto the roof? Well, how else are we supposed to see Rika-chan's dance? Did you really want to see Rika-chama's dance? Kei-chan, 
Could it be that your strike zone is really low? I don't think we're understanding each other here. Weren't you going to show me somewhere I could see Rika-chan's dance from easily? What? Who made that promise? Oh, let me... Oh, wait. Let me guess. She's showing me something else in her mind. Well, my... I don't even want to know what's going to happen. I mean, there's something happening, so let's... Let's see what happens. I don't mind... I'm mumbling. Yeah! What's going on? Why me? Why do I always misunderstand Shion? Is it my fault? Or am I just reading the wrong things into it? But then, why did you call me all the way out here? With an expression that indicated she wasn't fooling around, Shion pressed her index finger to my lips and said, slowly and quietly, This place is a dark, dead, empty spot. You can't see it from the festival grounds, and now... A male and female at the same age are all alone together. Eh? C -c Could this be... Xion? She's not planning something crazy again, is she? Oh, I bet she is. Shh. Look over there. See? Xion whispered, pointing into the dark underbrush. And there we saw two figures, one male and one female. Wh what's that? Is that... We're right at the scene of a rendezvous, of course. See? Look closely. Can you tell who they are? I peered intently into the dark at Shion's suggestion. Oh. Oh. It's Tomotaki-san and Takano-san. The two of them were clearly breathing quietly and glancing around to make sure nobody knew they were there as they crouched before the entrance to a wooden storehouse-like building. Wait, Chion. Could this be what you wanted to show me? Okay, chan You can see Rikachama's dance any year, but you won't ever get another chance like this, okay? I had thought the Sonazaki sisters each had their own personalities, but at times like this, they seemed all too similar. I'm going back. Don't call me for something like this again. Uh, if you move now, they'll see us. At our noisy argument, Takano-san suddenly turned around. Oh my, who might that be? We held our breaths and tried to wait it out, but it seemed like Takano-san was now acutely aware of our presence. Shion and I exchanged glances, then gave up and climbed out from behind the bush. Well, hello there. The moon sure is beautiful tonight, isn't it? My, my. If it isn't Xion-chan and my Barakun. Good evening. Yes, the moon certainly is pretty. What's this? Keiji-kun, you sure are smart, you know that? Having a secret date in a place like this. Then, I guess we accidentally interrupted something important. <laughs> You're the ones who were meeting up secretly. Tomotaki-san and Takano-san laughed to themselves, and it got on my nerves for some reason. Wait, so you two weren't having a little rendezvous then? Uh, of course we weren't. Though I don't dislike that kind of romance. Heh <laughs> Unfortunately, this wasn't the location of a rendezvous either of you would want to see. Sorry for not living up to your expectations. Hmm, if this wasn't a rendev... Rendev... Rend... I can't pronounce that right. If this wasn't a rendezvous, then what were you doing? Tomotaki-san, were you messing around with the padlock on the door just now? Huh? After she said that, I looked at the two of them again, and I definitely saw it. Well, so much for a date, I guess. They were hunched in front of a warehouse door fiddling with a pretty heavy-looking padlock. Guess we've been found out, huh? You were trying to break into the warehouse, but don't tell anyone, alright? Don't tell anyone? Are you thieves or something? I demanded unthinkingly, just because of how absently Tomotaki-san was grinning. Nah, never. 
Thieves are people who steal things, right? It's not like we were trying to take anything out of here. I see. Then why are you trying to unlock the door? This is the forbidden storehouse for ritual tools. They say only the Farood family and a mere handful of others are allowed in. Forbidden storehouse? I took a few steps back at that and looked on the entire warehouse. It certainly looked like one, built removed from any signs of people, almost as if in secret. It was filthy, revealing how little was ever opened. And it was built to be durable, giving it a strange, overpowering impression. Now that I looked at it more closely, it was certainly different than normal warehouses. This place... They're called Ritual Implements. Basically, this is a warehouse where they store such tools used in rituals. Well, more accurately, maybe it's a temple where the implements are enshrined. The ritual Ho Rikachan is using for the offertory dance was inside here until today. Of course, if anyone but the Faru family enters, they bring impurity into it. So absolutely no one is allowed a single step inside it. It's a sanctuary. Shouldn't we absolutely not be coming to a place like this then? However, Takano was wearing a childlike expression, an innocent smile at best, and terribly cruel grin at worst. I told you I was researching Hinamizawa's folktales and legends out of an interest in them, didn't I? A lot of the answers to questions I'm curious about are hidden away inside here. I've waited all this time until today for this chance. A chance. Everybody's eyes were fixed on the dance at the shrine grounds today. This was the ultimate blind spot. Heh, <laughs> I see. I didn't know you had pick lock picking skills, Tomotaki san. Stop it. I don't want to be doing this, okay? Sorry for taking you along with me, but... This was all thanks to you, Jurosan. I really am grateful. Sheesh. This is the only time. Understand, Takana-san? I don't want to be sneaking into places like this. <laughs> you really are a good person, Jurosan. Her clink. Tomotaki-san undid the padlock and placed it to the side. Uh-oh. It's open. Thank you. At long last. Takana-san gulped with an unusually excited air about her. She gave, the hev she gave the heavy door a shove. Oh man, what's going to be inside? The sharp smell of mold and dust flowed out from the gap in the doors. I had claimed curses didn't exist, but in this situation, I could believe in them. If we went into such a holy place with our shoes on, it feels like we could be punished somehow. How about it? You're our accomplices, too. You came all the way here, so why not come in and take the tour? It'll be a good- it'll be a little field trip to a museum of precious cultural artifacts that conceal the secret history of Hinamizawa. And it's only open today. <laughs> We're not accomplices or anything. Aren't you interested, though? Come on, let's take a peek. Shion said predictably, linking her arm with mine. But we definitely shouldn't be doing this. This is a holy warehouse, isn't it? You said ritual impl implements, right? I really feel like we shouldn't go in. I'm a part of the Sonazaki family, so I have a good guess as to what we'll find in there. But I want you to see it too, Keichan. You want to show something to me? I thought it was just a ploy, but Xian's eyes looked entirely serious. Of course, she was the sort who could lie with a straight face. Of course, I was an average boy too. My curiosity was at least twice that of a normal person. Sleeping, forbidden treasures, never to leave this warehouse. Chances like this don't come around too often. If I had to choose, then I want to see. Until the locked door is open, though, I don't know about this. 
If you're not interested, Keichan, then you can leave now. I think you'll wonder about it later, though. Tomotaki-san spoke after listening to our discussion, himself having sat down on the stairs to take a short rest. I'll keep watch here. Go in and check it out with them. I'm not too interested. But it might be pretty interesting for a young guy like you, Keijikun. <laughs> he said, laughing mischievously. There was no ill will in his laughter. Tomotaki-san, do you know what's in here? Kind of. Takano-san told me all about it. Must be a pain to have to go along with your companion's unique hobbies, huh? Tomotaki-san didn't answer that, only responding with a pain to smile. Takano-san had this kind of scary air about her, like she'd drop absolutely everything else for something she had an interest in and go straight for it, but... Tomotaki-san, on the other hand, seemed like the gold standard of what a normal person should be. Having him tell me so frankly to go check it out suddenly made the guilt feel lighter. Okay, but just a little. If it's not interesting, I'm leaving. You got it. Xion gave me another Mion likes wink. Mion like wink. Interesting. Looks like we're decided. Shall we go inside? Juro-san, we'll leave this to you. Tomotaki-san waved his hand to see us off. Ooh, we got a little uh, new background. This is a nice looking background right here. I mean, let me just look at this right here. We got a little, little bit of oldness inside. Maybe some a few objects. I can't even see the objects because it's a little bit blurry. I mean, it is a, one of these games after all. The inside was pitch black, but Takano-san turned on the battery-powered lantern she brought, revealing a pretty cramped front room. It's so dark in here. Everyone, take care not to trip over anything. I appreciate the concern. Okay, doorman. Keep a good watch. We're shutting the door now. Takano-san smiled spitefully as if leaving Tomotaki-san out of something fun and began to close the door. Man. Alright, everyone. Have fun. Yeah, I'll keep that in mind. There was a low, heavy, and loud noise, and we were completely cut off from the outside world and covered in silent darkness. Takano-san's lantern was the only light we had. It'll be fine. It's an outdoor lantern with backup batteries inside. It won't go out or anything. Looks like Takano noticed my uneasy expression. I couldn't help but blush a little and and avert my gaze. Deeper inside, there was a heavy and old but sturdy door with solemn decorations on it. It was the last door, ceiling way, that was within. Strange how it was an antechamber, even though it was just a warehouse, isn't it? I believe it's set up this way so that you open it one door at a time, never letting the room with all the tools be seen from the outside. Takano-san explained this awfully impressed by the construction. But still, it's really dark in here. Huh? That over there, it's... I spotted a circuit breaker hanging from a clump of wiring, clumsily attached to the wall. Oh, here. Isn't this the light switch or something? I flipped the biggest switch I could find, and with a click, the pitch black room was illuminated by an old, bare light bulb. Everyone scrunched up their faces at the sudden strobe-like brightness. Don't! Before she even finished, Xion slapped my hand and flipped the switch back. There was another loud click and the room returned to darkness with only the lantern for illumination. Ow! You can't, Keichan! We snuck in here, remember? If you turn on the light, it might give us away. I'm scolded by Xion, fairly harshly. Well, she's right. It looked like she was worried about whether someone had seen them from the momentary light. It's alright. It was only for a moment. Takano-san remained a relaxed adult. 
It seemed like she was confident she could talk her way out of it if someone did see us. Let's go in. Here we go. There. The even heavier door opened, and this time, it wasn't just the dust that came out with the air. There was also a nasty smell. One smell was like opening a dust-filled cupboard in the back of a kitchen that hadn't been opened in years. And the other smell, the nasty one, was hard to explain, but it was like the raw odor of a fish market. From how the sound echoed, this room felt far larger than the first. Takano-san held up her lantern and revealed the contents of the expansive room. Whoa! At the back wall of the storehouse, right in front of us, was a Buddha-like holy object standing there looking down at us. I was taken aback by its unseen force lit up by the slender beam of the lantern. That's the guardian god of Hinamizawa, oyashiro sama it's far grander than the one at the shrine. Oh yes, sure, Osama. So this is the spirit protecting Hinamizawa. The one guarding the holy land of Hinamizawa from the impurities of the outside world. And the one delivering punishment after punishment upon those who attempted to sully the land with the dam construction. It looks like there are far more tools stored here than I thought, but... This is so sad. None of them have been maintained. How unfortunate that they're in such a state. Even in the dim light, I can see a lot of strange objects lining the walls, ceiling, and shelves. Takano-san, speaking as if in a trance, was infatuated by the various implements filling the dark room. They weren't very festival-like or traditional, but instead, this was more like the workshop of a blacksmith or a carpenter. There were a lot of large wooden and metal tools packed in here. Putting it bluntly, it was all pretty boring stuff. I'd imagine there would be more artistic things in here from the high-end period, but these are, these are a far cry from being cultural artifacts. My expression betrayed my dashed hopes, and they caught on right away. Oh... Is this not interesting for you? I'm not into a literature. I'm not into literature or art, so I can look at this stuff, but I don't really understand its value. <laughs> hey, Jikun, you really do look like you don't get it. I guess that's only natural. Takano-san reached into a paper bag that she'd been holding the whole time, took out a worn scrapbook, and began to flip through it. Then, just for you, Keiji-kun. I'll tell you an old story. Oh boy, let's listen to it. It's a common tale in this region. If you go to the library, it would even be on their recommended reading list. Telling stories in such a dark, creepy place? She must have a horror story in mind. Shion's face belied, belied nothing but calm. If she had the same personality as Mion, she'd have found fault with me being scared. I'll endure it for now and pretend to be calm. Okay? Alright, I'll read it. After confirming that I was going to be quiet and listen, she began to speak softly like a kindergarten teacher. Like a, began to speak softly like a kindergarten teacher reading a picture book. Long, long ago, in a certain village in the mountains, there was a swamp. This swamp was very, very deep. Some even called it bottomless. People said it was... Con People said it was connected to hell, the land of the demons. The rumor said that it was deeper than the ocean, and that anyone it swallowed would sink into the underworld, a bottomless swamp. Its name was Onikafuchi. Wait, I thought back to the story I heard yesterday about the sacrifices sinking in the bottomless swamp. Could that be the swamp she's talking about? So then the village was Hanamizawa, right? You catch on quickly. That's right. Though it was called Onikafuchi Village at the time. Onikafuchi Village. That's a pretty inauspicious name. It evokes quite the image, doesn't it? 
I hear that the name was changed in the Meiji period. The name of the swamp connected to hell was called Onikafuchi, which meant the demon's abyss. And the true name of this village, Hanamizawa, was Onikafuchi village. The villagers belonged to that abyss, or to hell in other words. They lived their lives worshipping the swamp said to connect to it. But then one day, demons began to appear, one after the other, from deep in the swamp. The villagers feared that hell was overflowing. The demons merciless, mercilessly attacked the villagers. They could only watch in fear. They could do no more than hide themselves and tremble. So did someone exterminate them? Unfortunately, there is no Momotaro or Superman in this fairy tale. Then, did they get the whole village together to fight them? Heavens, no. The villagers weren't nearly strong enough to fight on equal terms with the demons. Then, the only recourse would be to flee the village. They couldn't do that either. To the villagers, it was their beloved homeland. It didn't matter how terrifying the demons, they wouldn't have run away so easily. Then what did they do? Wouldn't they just get wiped out? Unable to fight and unable to run, all they could do was wait for the village to be destroyed. Then when everyone had lost hope, their god, Oyashiro-sama, descended onto them. I see. So Oyashiro-sama came down from the sky and beat up all the demons then. You're such a boy, Kei-chan. You always jump straight to using force to resolve things. Shion sighed, a little annoyed. Embarrassed, I held my tongue. The thing about Oyashiro-sama, he wasn't a violent god who would beat them up like you're saying. He was a kind god filled with love and benevolence. The strength of Oyashiro-sama descended from the heavens couldn't be compared to that of the demons. They didn't even fight, they simply prostrated themselves before his radiant authority. Oyashiro-sama urged them to go back to hell from whence they came, but the demons wept and challenged him, saying they could never return. The world of the demons too has harsh commandments. They claimed they had been banished, they had been banished from hell demons, who didn't have a place to go, either in hell or in the human world. Of course, they were at fault for attacking the village. They deeply reflected on it and were sorry. As the villagers conversed amongst themselves, little by little, they came to pity the demons and, after talking with everyone in the village, they decided to live alongside them. Alongside them. A lot of fairy tales have been, have them being exterminated or driven away, but you don't often hear one where they live in peace. You're right. Demons are supposed to symbolize all evils. A story where they decide to live together with humans is certainly strange. When the demons first heard the villagers' invitation, they doubted their ears but soon burst into tears of joy. The villagers had given them a place to live. It was said that in payment for this good deed, the demons shared their many kinds of power and secrets with the villagers. Oyashiro-sama was very pleased with this happy exchange. Exchange. He gave the demons the bodies of humans so that they would be indistinguishable from the villagers. He himself decided to stay on the surface and watch over the everlasting peace between them. A land in which man, demon, and god live together. I had thought the word demon was a noun meaning evil that needs to be exterminated. A god may have meditated for them, but you don't often hear happy endings like that where both sides live in harmony. I see, I guess it is kind of interesting. Although the normal fairy tale ends there, it was revised quite a bit during the end of, during the Edo period. Edo or Edo? Oh, the Edo period into a much longer story. After that, the humans and demons 
intermixed and eventually there was no difference between them. So the demons ended up disappearing? No, not at all. Half of them stayed just as they were. The knowledge the villagers had received from the demons basically made them into something inhuman, what people call transcendent. transcendent. They were all aware the power they had was heresy, and as those below worshipped them, they lived out their lives in secrecy. This story is the root of many der derivative tales and pieces of fiction. It's the foundation, I mean. The basis. What do you mean by root? She means the part about the villagers having demon blood. What I mean is, all of the legends from around here are based on the premise that the villagers are descended from demons. There was a hint of amusement in Shion's face as she said that. It was like she wanted to say that she too had demon blood in her. Is there any proof though? Maybe it's somehow rooted in historical fact beyond just fairy tales. Oh, my Barakun, then do you believe that demons really did come out of the swamp and breed with humans? Hmm, well, it's not that I don't believe it, but... When she said demon, she meant the ones from hell, but... In ancient Japan, the word wasn't necessarily used to denote only that kind, right? The more well-known use involves the drifting foreigner theory. As the story goes, Westerners who were shipwrecked in nearby seas had such markedly markedly different customs that they were called the demons. Japanese people were relatively similar in appearance to other Asians, but everything about those from the West was different. Their physiques, their faces, and their skin color. In Japan, terms like red demon and blue demon evoke images, especially of Westerners. Lacking in skin pigments, Westerners would sunburn easily and turn red. Being fair skin, I think blood vessels appearing on their skin would look blue too. A handful of accidental aliens would drift into Japan and came, and came under persecution, being called demons. They would flee into the mountains to survive, turn into banded groups, and attack villages for food and, and the like. How does that ex explanation sound? Maybe it's a bit childish. Takano gave me a weird smile when having come up with such a impromptu hypothesis, I unconsciously followed it up with self-deprecation. Still, she didn't smile as if to make fun of me. It's not ridiculous. There are a lot of people who subscribe to the dr drifting foreigner theory. Even so, nobody actually knows what happened. Were they groups of foreigners who had turned to banditry, or were they really demons who had come from the bottom of the world? Then er... Takano-san, which one do you believe? The truth of the matter aside, I rather believe the more fantastic explanation. It's more fun that way, isn't it? Try. I would agree with that. Her answer made her sound a wee bit like a romantic tis. Romantic t I don't know. Romantic tist? Romantist. Or whatever. Here I thought she'd reject unrealistic stories like that. Now then, this is where the fun begins. Oh boy. Takano-san brought an end to her storytelling and waits for a moment as if to tantalize us. Huh? Suddenly, Shion looked around as if something had caught her eye. Her head bobbed to and fro, like she was making sure nothing had changed. What's wrong, Shion? I'm sorry. Uh, please don't worry about it. Shion pretended as though nothing had happened. But what? Takano-san also made sure nothing had happened, then cleared her throat and broached the next subject. I explained that half of the villagers have demon blood. That blood, they actually say that it's the blood of the kind of demon that eats people. Man-eating demons? That escalated quickly. That blood still runs through the villagers' veins. They say that sometimes the blood awakens from its slumber. I thought the fairy tale had a happy ending with the humans and demons living in peace, but 
it began to suddenly change into a brutal, bloody story. Well, they eat people. They say that every decade or so, they can't help but want to feast on human flesh. The villagers can't eat other villagers, so when this happens, it's said that they descended on the human villages and conducted Onikakushi. What's an Onikakushi? Broadly speaking, it's when a demon kidnaps someone. When a person is demoned away. Oh, I remember that part. They say that the villagers of Onikakushi would overwhelm unfortunate human villages in order to kidnap sacrifices. Takano-san's explanation was plain and simple, but when I imagined what it must have been like, it was terrifying. They lose their human reason. The villagers turn into real demons in mass. They attack the villagers they loathe in the dirty world of the masses below. And then they kill and eat their sacrifices. So they're no different from demons after all. What did Oyashiro-sama do? Wasn't he supposed to be staying in the village and watching over them? Oyashiro-sama knew about it, of course. Onikakushi isn't indiscriminate. The villagers apparently never kidnapped anyone other than the sacrifices decided upon by their god. In the texts, it's usually one or two people. A village inhabited by those both human and, and inhuman. It was like the heartwarming episode's colors had inverted, like a negative film, revealing the painful and ugly truth. So on the nights when they raided villages, they would feast on their kidnapped sacrifices, which is why the knights came to be known as Watanagashi. Watanagashi. Tonight's festival was Watanagashi. I just couldn't reconcile. I, I just couldn't reconcile the reconcile or whatever. The fun festival with the horrible tale Takano-san was telling me. Well, Tanagashi, well, wasn't it, wasn't it about giving thanks to the futons we use over the winter or something? Kei-chan, Wata has another meaning, you know. It means entrails. Shion, who had been silent until now, spoke up. Entrails? Oh yeah, I guess that's true. Like fish guts. Wait, what? Like a jigsaw puzzle, the fun times I had today and Takano-san's grotesque tale clicked together in my mind. Watanagashi, so gut spilling. So does this festival involve gore? I didn't think saying that could ever feel so nauseating. Yes. It's as you imagine, my Barakun. Right now, the Watanagashi Festival might just be a somewhat early summer festival occurring every June, but it used to be different. It used to be a ghastly, cannibalistic feast held on the night the villagers had collected their, their unfortunate dinner. But that can't be true. I had no real reason to say that, but I couldn't help it. My Barakun, you said that Watanagashi is a ritual about purifying futons, right? What do you think the futons filled with cotton with Wata represent? Futons are futons. They're beds. They're things for sleeping in. What else could they possibly represent? I was rattling on, desperately attempting to deny the horrible festival that Takano-san was describing. Deep down, however, I found myself understanding all too well what she meant. Futons stuffed with cotton. If the cotton represented entrails in both pronunciation and meaning, then entrail-filled futons would have to be humans. Why don't you think back to the offertory dance Rika-chan performed? Do you know what she was doing up there? No, I don't. I didn't even watch the whole thing anyway. What? Kei-chan, you're getting too worked up. Xi'an grabbed one of my ears, reminding me that this wasn't somewhere I should raise my voice. Even so, I still can't suppress this agitation I feel. Rika-chan was carrying a festival hoe. 
You've probably realized it already, but that's not a hoe for plowing fields. It's a tool for dissecting human bodies. You've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me, man. I don't remember this from the last game. Did I? I didn't see the dance all the way through, so I don't know what kind of performance Rika-chan was putting on after I'd left. When I told this to Takano-san, she kindly explained Rika-chan's dance to me. To summarize what she's... Hmm. To summarize what she said after what I'd seen, Rika-chan would pierce the futons with that hoe, cut them open, and pull out the cotton inside. She cut the cotton out one bit at a time and set it afloat. That's the kind of ritual it was. Broadly speaking, it was quite the bombastic ceremony where they'd rip out the guts and throw them into a basin. And then the ritual was over. It's thought that afterwards, the villagers, each with a different role, dismantled the flesh piece by piece and feasted upon it. <laughs> At Takano-san's strangely happy giggle, I felt for some reason, violent displeasure. Rika-chan, every day during our lunch break, she'd take a rice-pounding mallet into the schoolyard, and she'd work so hard sweating bullets to practice for the offertory dance she had done today. All that effort. All that work. Takano-san disgraced it, even though she worked so hard to practice for today. Takano-san, I think you should choose your words more carefully. Kei-chan's pretty naive, so please don't tease him too much or so much. A moment before I opened my mouth to express how angry I was, Xion stopped me. Xion must have been fully aware of how that story made me feel. I'm sorry. I thought you'd like a story with that sort of shock value since you're a boy. Takano-san spoke without a hint of malice as she, gra as she smiled gracefully. After hearing all that, did you figure out what kind of stuff is, is in this storehouse, Kei-chan? See? Look. Xion pointed out one of the walls vaguely illuminated by the lantern's light. Okay. I'm gonna pause here real quick for now. Because I think I reach, reached my limit here. But yeah, that is one intense story. So, next part, let's see what we can find in the warehouse. So, like, comment, and subscribe, and see you later. Have a good one.